Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today's first story is, secure it but leave the keys in it. Roger that LT. This happened back in my army days, on deployment to Afghanistan. I was an E4 despite being in for around 7 years at this point, because I decided to self-medicate for a while before seeking help for PTSD, and was a bit of a fixture in my unit after spending my entire army career in this unit. Despite my F-ups, I was well liked by most of my unit, and especially by my CO, company commander, and one SG, first sergeant, the enlisted counterpart to the CO. I was what the army calls a deployment soldier, someone who you love to have in your unit while deployed, but gets a bit, let's say, distracted, and has a tendency to get in a bit of trouble when back in the garrison, or the US for too long. I was known for being sarcastic, a jokester, and hardworking when it mattered, but tended to be the typical long-term E4 when it came to BS duties in garrison. For instance, taking a three-month staycation when our old base defense duty. But that's a story for another time. Also important to the story, I was also known for rarely being seen without my best friend Jay, who I went to basic with and was lucky enough to be in the same unit my entire career. And if we were left without supervision for too long, well, leadership knew not to let that happen. Consequences could range from the time the entirety of the barracks living members of the company missed PT the day after St. Patrick's Day, due to the three-story beer bong monstrosity we created, to, well, this story. To the story. I had recently been switched to ops, operations, basically they put me behind a desk, to be the armorer, the guy that makes the pew pews go pew again when they stop pewing, from the front line, despite having no training and definitely not the best person for the job. This led to me being the lone person on the night shift, as troops tend to take very good care of their weapons when downrange, and if something does break, it usually has to go to battalion armorers the guys that were actually trained to fix them, so honestly there wasn't much for me to do. I won't get into all my duties but it wasn't much, it wasn't hard, and I was bored. Cute side note, the best nights were when the mind dog assigned to us couldn't sleep and came to the TOC, Tactical Operations Center, and I got to play with her most of the night. Back to the story. Before I was switched, Jay was in the lead vehicle, which hit an IED. He was medevaced on a chopper, but luckily himself and two others were concussed and beaten up, but otherwise okay. RIP to the driver, sadly. He was only 19 and was placed on life support, but it was removed at the request of his parents less than 24 hours later. Anyway, Jay came back to the unit, but leadership was wary of sending him back on a mission too soon, and he was placed on night shift with me. To this day, even the CO and his PL, platoon leader, usually a second lieutenant, aka Butterbar, can't explain why they thought putting he and I together on night shift unsupervised for 12 hours a night was a good idea. With both of us being well-liked and in our specific company for longer than anyone else there, we got pretty brave, and there were quite a few antics and pranks pulled on the company leadership, most of which were tolerated and laughed about, and I can go into detail later if anyone is interested. This antic, however, was not loved by the officers. Not at all. While deployed, military cooks serve midnight chow, which is exactly what it sounds like. Since we were on a larger base this time around, our unit was issued a gator. Think electric golf, except where the rear seat and club holders would be, there's a small dump truck bed. We would use this to drive to pick up midnight chow and drive back, and sometimes other members of the unit would use it for work, or just to avoid taking the buses on base. Well, one particular morning a group of lower enlisted took it to the gym and stayed longer than usual, and when the officers woke up they wanted to go get breakfast, only to find they had to use the bus because the gator was gone. Jay and I were berated and told that we weren't supposed to let anyone below a platoon sergeant rank use the gator. First, we'd heard of this rule, but whatever. This happens all the time in the army. Adjust and move on. Since we were ops, we were still allowed gator use, so we didn't care. That is, until one morning I left shift with the gator key still in my pocket, and they couldn't find them or use the gator, until I showed up for my next shift. Thus ends the gator use for anyone but the 1SG, who never used it anyway, the CO, and the XO, second in command of the CO on the officer side, usually a first lieutenant, but in this case a butter bar. Our exact orders were, the keys stay in the gator, and no one uses it without our permission. And I was told off pretty harshly by the XO. Usually you can get away with a bit of argument with a butter bar, the good ones anyway, after you've been in the military for a while. And this XO really was a good one. I guess he was just having a bad day or something, I don't know. But I knew better than to press my luck and argue. There's more than one way to break in a new LT after all. So now we finally come to the malicious compliance. Jay and I were fairly annoyed with the XO's actions, and since we had nothing better to do that night, and I sure as heck wasn't going to let him think his rank allows him to not give people decent human respect, we spent the first few hours thinking of how to teach him a lesson. Knowing the CO had left to the brigade headquarters earlier that day, we came to the conclusion that since we couldn't bring the key inside anymore, but still needed to secure the gator, we'd need to get creative. 
That night, we decided that since we had to be inside and couldn't have eyes on it, we'd need to hide it, or at least place it out of reach. Outside on a smoke break, we saw the connexes, or railroad containers for civilian speak. They were stacked too high, with empties on top and extra supplies on bottom. We looked at each other and immediately knew what to do. We took turns building a makeshift ramp that night and slowly eased the gator up to the top of one of the stacks, turned it off, left the keys in and disassembled the ramp. Luckily, we left before the XO woke up and the 1SG didn't notice it was missing, since he never used it. Getting back that night, we were a bit nervous, but when we walked in, the 1SG tried hard to hide a smile. We knew we were in the clear then. Sure enough, the XO comes to us with a red face. XO, what the heck was that? Us, what was what, sir? XO, don't give me that SH, the gator. Us, well, sir, you said we had to keep the gator secure from anyone without your permission, but we have to stay inside and couldn't see it. Since we had to leave the keys in it as well and didn't have any guidance, we thought the best thing would be to put it where no one can reach it. This is the point the 1SG breaks down laughing, and the XO knows nothing will happen to us, so he says, Okay, that was good, you had your fun, but don't put it up there again. Us. Roger, sir. We later found out they used a crane from the contractors to get it down. Probably for the best, no one got hurt that way. Still under the same orders with one caveat and inspired by the crane usage. That night I took a trip to the contractors, and after explaining the situation to them, they happily agreed to use the crane to move a barrier from our mortar bunker out of the way, long enough for us to fit the gator in, then replace it. There was physically no way to get it out without a crane. Things happened much the same that night, except this time we had new orders, that we were not to hide the gator at all. The 1SG stayed behind that night for a few smokes with Jay and I, laughing but telling us he can't protect us forever but he was interested in seeing how it all plays out, so he wouldn't stop us from continuing. But tread carefully. We thanked him and quickly came up with our new plan, but this time waited until about 3 a.m., thinking the XO may have a surprise visit. Sure enough, around 1 we saw a red flashlight beam shine on the gator during a smoke break, and while we can't prove it was the XO, we assume it was. Around 3 we began unscrewing the entire front wall of the TOC, drove the gator inside and replaced the wall. That morning, the XO unexpectedly arrives with the 1SG before we were off shift. The 1SG walks in and laughs so hard he can't breathe. Hearing a loud sigh outside the door, the XO enters, stares at our work, and walks out, head down, without saying a word. This time, the 1SG made us undo our work, since it would interfere with operations, and later that night, the XO told us we'd made our point, and we even got an apology. After that, anyone could use the gator as long as it was back by breakfast, and the CO had one heck of a laugh when he returned. The second story is, I guess I'll reply to all. I'm a software developer. My department and another department each made different products, but a customer would often have both, and these products need to communicate with each other. Both teams had the task of adding a new feature, which required some modification to how the products communicate. Communication is done via a published protocol, which means that our two teams just need to follow the spec, which is great. The teams are in different countries, so time zones make direct collaboration somewhat challenging. My team finished our changes, and so I reached out to my counterpart on the other team to arrange for testing our products together. They were still working on it, and that was all I heard from them for a while. That's fine, we were ahead of schedule, I can wait until they're ready. I set up a sample installation on a spare server, and told them how to access it remotely, and asked that they let me know if they need anything. A week or two passed before they were ready, and they started testing on a Friday. They encountered some problems, so they sent me an email. Because of the time zones, this was past my working hours, and I wasn't checking my work email. When I didn't reply, they wrote another email, CCing their boss and my boss. When a reply to that email didn't come quickly enough, they CC'd even higher on the chain of command, demanding that my team work to fix the problem. They further stated that if the problem was not immediately fixed, their release would be late, and it would entirely be my team's fault. On Saturday, I got a call from my boss explaining the situation. He politely asked me if I could spare some time to come in on the weekend to troubleshoot the problem. I agreed. I spent some time reading log files and packet captures and comparing system behavior to the spec. Soon enough, I found the problem. Their product was sending messages that did not conform to the spec. I was able to simulate the bad message and a fixed version of that message to confirm that our product handled both as it should. Nobody from the other team was online, so I sent my report by email. Remember how they sent that email blaming my team for their problems? The email that went to their boss, their boss's boss, my boss and my boss's boss. Yeah, that was the email I replied to, replying to all. I very politely and professionally explained exactly what the problem was, making sure my explanation would be clear to those upper level managers before going into the technical details and what changes they would need to make to fix the problem. Clicking the send button has never felt so satisfying. Working on the weekend resulted in me being in a much better mood than if I'd stayed home the whole time. 
And per department policy, I took some calm time during the week to make up for those weekend hours. This was my first time working with this team, but from what others told me, this wasn't an unusual experience. A few years later the company was restructured, and that office was closed down completely. And the last story is, won't be taught by a girl, so he got fired. So I used to work for my grandparents on an oil farm in Texas. I was 17, freshly graduated from high school, and had moved from the Midwest to Texas to live with my grandparents and work on the oil farm they worked for doing some easy data entry. The building was essentially a tin building on the job site where my grandma and I, the only two office workers besides my grandfather who was the foreman, worked. Basically when the new hires would come in that had missed the initial hiring round, I was the one that would make sure all their paperwork was in order and that they had all of their OSHA classes finished. And if any safety training hadn't been done, I would just put in the VHS and confirm on a written copy that they had finished it, under my instruction. This went on for two months, with no issues, until one fateful day, a regular Florida man, record and all, came in as a new hire and came to my office to finish his new hire paperwork. Once he was in my office, I found he had no safety training to speak of, and I informed him his next day or two would be spent in my office watching safety videos. All of this was paid, of course. He immediately flew into a rage, screaming about how he wouldn't have some little girl teaching him how to do his job, which again, I was a 17-year-old female. At the time, I now identify as non-binary and was only going through company standards and OSHA rules with him. I went to my grandfather who was my boss at the time, obviously very confused and uncomfortable and unsure of how I should proceed. To which my grandfather said, you want to fire him? Cue my excitement. My grandfather follows me to my office and I, as a 17 year old, get to fire this grown A man sitting in front of me. I start directing him to gather his things and leave and he starts up a huge fit, yelling and cursing at me, before he noticed my grandfather standing in the door with his gun holstered on his hip. My grandfather usually kept this locked in a safe on the ground or in his truck. I hadn't realized until after he pulled it out just for me. And very quietly then he got up and left. The most satisfying moment of my life. If you want more stories subscribe to the channel. See you next time!